Howdy again, it's the next day and I'm back in the garage, raring to go here and reassembling here the South Bend lathe. So the next thing I'll do is to put the uh, reverse bracket on here. I already put this bracket on, there's just one bolt that clamps to the bed and that's for the gear guard. So as always, I can't emphasize enough how you need to clean things. Generally a clean wag and then also wiping and then always some oil because you don't know when this will be taken apart again. It may be years and you don't want anything uh, sticking. Again, this reverses the lead screw and also has a neutral position if you remember. And I will leave it in the neutral position for right now because it prevents wear to the gears. So you don't want to have all these gears running when you're doing uh, operations where there aren't any power feeds or, or any threading going on. And it reduces the noise also as you're uh, using the machine. And then next comes the banjo. You can see why they call it that. Now as I recall I will need to spread this just a little bit to get that on so I'll put a screwdriver in there to act as a wedge because it's just a little uh, collapsed enough to where I can't get it on I don't really want to tap it on. Now I recall that from when I had to take it off. And there's my wedge, just a stubby screwdriver. Then it goes right on. And there's a uh, shoulder bolt there with a, uh, it's a cap screw rather. And it takes a hex key. Must be about a 5 16 This is the shaft, you remember, that goes into the quick change gearbox. So we've got a couple gears that have to go back on. And there's a key. And this gear is not really in use now. It's just a uh, a spare and it's being stored here and it's acting as a spacer if and when uh, it needs to be exchanged for this. In other words they flip-flop and um, you have to move this gear in and out and so on and you have to look at the manual for that but it's just set up now for regular work through the quick change gearbox and I'm not going to change any of that and a washer and a nut. I like these big old nuts that they used years ago. They were called finished nuts as opposed to cheap stamped plated nut that you're going to find at a box store. So don't throw these away if you're uh, redoing a lathe. Now at this point I'm ready to engage the gears and then tighten this uh, cap screw right here. Now there is uh, a given distance on uh, meshing gears and you don't want to jam this up to where they're bottoming out nor do you want because uh, that'll cause excess wear and noise nor do you want to have them uh, only partially engaged because you're going to damage a tooth and if you look in the atlas book they show there what the clearance uh, should be and since we're not going to calculate it all that accurately uh, we're going to use a, a sheet of uh, a little piece of writing paper in there as a gauge. Now uh, at the factory for instance the distance here from the center of this gear to the center of this gear would have been very accurately located and there is a mathematical uh, 
formula that can be used to determine that distance, but of course we can't do that when adjusting the gears here. So just taking a little piece of uh, paper, like writing paper, put it between the two gears and mesh them and then I can tighten this and get the paper out of there. Still a little piece in there, I don't want to pinch my fingers. Let me get that out. So that's how you should adjust that. Now I don't know if this was shown in the South Bend book or not. I couldn't find it uh, looking at it, uh, looking for it, so I just got it out of this, the Atlas book. And of course these gears should be lubricated with a good oil, such as this gear lube, and I've put the gear guard on which sadly needs a paint job. So I'm done on this end, at least for now. And I'm going to come back later and show how to lubricate all of this in another video. And next comes the gear guard. And you may see some real old lathes that do not have guards over these gears with the operator standing right next to it. No wonder so many men had missing fingers and there's two screws, one here and one here. 832's. And then the gear guard for the other gears here, and I do not know why this is so chewed up. Also, one screw here and one on the back. That pretty well buttons up the headstock. And I'll put this link back on that uh, is the belt tensioner. When I installed the pin down here that holds the tension uh, bracket on, I used the new cotter key. I always use the new cotter key. Don't, don't use old ones. They're so cheap. Now I put the belt on plugged it back in and I'm putting just a little bit of this belt aid belt dressing on there and you can get this in a spray also this can is older than the hills as I recall I replaced this belt when I bought the lathe I guess I'm not too sure but I never did put any belt dressing on there so I let that run in just a little bit just that gives the belt a grip on these flat pulleys And on goes the thread chasing dial. I haven't oiled the uh, lead screw yet. I'll do that later. And in fact, I'm going to put this on. You see, you can engage and disengage this. And I'm going to put it in the disengaged position. Uh, because again that's something you don't want to have running or wearing on you when you're not using it, when you're not threading, which would be 98% of the time. Keep it backed out. You see it won't, it doesn't turn now because it's not engaged with the lead screw. And I'm sure you know that already. Next comes installing the cross slide and as you recall this uh, gib is damaged and if there's enough interest and if enough people watch these videos then I think I'll make a new one probably and do a video of it but otherwise I won't bother I'm hesitant to to file that off but so I'm going to assemble it this way with the thoughts of making a, a new one whether or not I do a video on it so everything has been cleaned thoroughly both here here and here and we need a lot of oil when we put this back together And similarly, over here, here, and in the dovetail, and on the gib, and I'm going to uh, rub that all in and uh, off camera. Then I'm ready to slide it on. Remember that there's also an issue here with this crank and the play that we've got here, and somebody has this all cobbled up here. 
the original nut is missing, so there must be some damage to that thread. I have not taken it off. Now, a lot of this is covered in my video course. There's 40 chapters, how to run a South Bend lathe. So I go into much more detail in those videos. And some of this is a repetition. The gib is in place, but it's loose. Now bring that up and I will feel it when the uh, screw hits the brass nut, which is right now. And now I have it engaged and I'll bring it all the way back into this position where it gets used the most. And then I'm going to tighten, or I should say, adjust the gibbs. I might remind you that 10 inch South Bend lathe, at least the one I have, has only one adjustment screw and that is right here because it's a tapered gib pretty much like what is on a Bridgeport mill. Now I have brought all five of these little uh, gib screws just snug with this little screwdriver and these are slotted. You might find some that have a, a hex, require a hex key and on the Atlas, there's, uh, there's little screws with the lock nuts. Now, the reason I'm taking so much time on this is often you, you need to readjust these. And there are times when you snug them up and uh, it essentially are locking the cross slide, possibly when you do, or, or you want it very, very tight when you're using uh, your milling attachment. But for now, it's a matter of feel and experience as to how tight you want those and it feels like it's just about right. I'm just going to go over them one more time. I don't like it where uh, it's so tight that you need two hands to turn the crank. Again, there's just an awful lot of backlash here, both due to the... That's how much backlash there is in here due to the, uh, the thread and the brass nut. And then again, I told you that we got backlash here too because of uh, this cobbled up mess on the end. So the two together gives me, oh, I could measure it, but I suppose at least a sixteenth inch, maybe more, of, of backlash. But you're always going to have some backlash on even on a brand new lathe, but certainly not that much, but it's just something we have to contend with. So that, that's it for the uh, cross slide. And then I like to add a little more oil as well after it's assembled, but I'm going to talk about that later. And now for the compound rest and wipe this, make sure it's clean, and, and it is. And remember that uh, if you have any dings on there that you can feel, it's only the raised ones that are a problem. Do not file this, but take uh, an oil stone and just dress it ever so lightly. And same with this, and it's been cleaned. We got the dovetail there. And make sure that your pins in here are already in, and, and mine are. And then, of course, oil. And a little bit in here and the dovetail. There we go. And now we've got the two screws here. And I'm going to set it at 29 degrees and lock this, the two of them. There's really several things that still require my attention. Again, the uh, screw here, this screw, and the tail stock. But for now, what I'm doing is just trying to get this thing up and running. And the last thing I want to do is to check the tailstock alignment. And I don't know if I've talked about that, but yes, I guess I have. I did an awful lot of videos on how to align the tailstock. Remember that the tailstock is made in two pieces. Here's the bottom and here's the top. And that on uh, both the front and the back, there's a little set screw. And when this is loose, we're able to basically move not basically, we're able to move the top part of the tailstock back and forth. 
like this. And on the end of, of every tailstock, there are witness marks, zero marks. I'll bring the camera around and show those to you if you've never seen them, but I sure, I'm sure you have. And looking at the tailstock from this end, you will see the witness marks. And although they appear to be coinciding right on, they really aren't. Or they may be, or they may not be. So that's just a way of getting in the ballpark, but you really have to use an indicator, like I'm going to show you real briefly here and see if we can get it in to zero. Now you can use different kinds of indicators, but I like the plunger type, and you need to indicate it from the front, not from the top. You can also use uh, this style, and it has to be mounted on the carriage someplace. But rather than mount it way over here, where it's out of the way, I like to put it on the Aloris, and it's a little bit more centered, and I could jockey this around, and I won't get a full reading from one end to the other, but this is, I believe, a 12-inch bar, and you've seen that. It's accurately made. It's, uh, it's between centers right now, and uh, what we're going to do here is, can you see that this is on zero? Perhaps not. The needle is on zero, and as I move it from one end to the other, you're going to see that the needle is moving. Now, part of that might be due to the wear on the bed. I'm not even sure, but I can come down fairly. That's as far as I can go without extending the quill, but that's sufficient. And I am five thousandths off, and that's not good, but I've seen it a lot worse. And for general uh, use, that might even be close enough, but uh, what I'm going to do now is to loosen the lock nut on the tailstock, and then using two screwdrivers, one against the other, I will move it until I get half the distance here, I think is what I want, but usually it takes several readings and passes to determine that, so I'm going to loosen that up off camera, but I don't want it so loose that the test bar is not held properly between the centers and would fall out or would just wobble in there. It has to be tight. Now watch carefully, and I had to take the screws out and uh, repair the slots because they were so buggered up. But as I turn the one that is closest to me, the operator, just a little bit, you will see the needle zero out, I hope. Are you seeing it move? Okay, it's on zero, and I have to take a couple passes back and forth now and see if that uh, changes the zero position when I get toward the headstock. Okay, I'm spot on, and that kind of surprises me. And I, again, I'm on zero right here. You may not be able to see that. And it's going to fluctuate a little bit in the middle here now, and that's probably due to the sway back bed. I'm not sure of that, but can you, can you see the needle moving now? Oh, two or three thousandths off. But as I get toward the tail stock, it's coming back to zero. There's nothing I can do about what's in the middle. That's just wear on the machine. And now I will lock those two screws against each other in the tailstock off camera and uh, make sure that it didn't move on me but right now the tailstock is in alignment. Well that concludes this video. The machine is assembled uh, ready to lubricate and then ready to use and I'll going to have a lubrication uh, video probably the next one coming up. Uh, watch all of the videos in this series if you will and uh, hope this helps you if you have a South Bend lathe and it probably will apply to other brands of lathes as well. So the machine is about as good as it's going to get without uh, some uh, uh, major grinding and rework and uh, I'm sorry I didn't paint it but that it's uh, as clean as you can get it. Hope you enjoyed the video. This is Tubal Cain saying so long for now, and I'll see you in my next video.